Greetings, and welcome back to the channel, as we continue our look at sci-fi cinema in the 1940s. In 1944, the genre continued to mix with horror and revolved around themes of monsters, brain transplants, and mad scientists. Universal released its sixth Frankenstein and fifth Invisible Man films, giving up on original characters. Sequels weren't just for the big studios. Poverty Row produced its fair share of sequels, with the return of an ape man and a jungle woman. For the mad scientist, it was about mind control, ignoring ethics and delving into the darker aspects of both the scientific and the supernatural. A popular character made his debut, but barely resembled his comic book counterpart. And then there was one British film, a refreshing comedy that breaks the 1940s sci-fi mold with its time travel antics, proving that even in an era of eerie experiments and monstrous transformations, there was room for a bit of light-hearted fun. After the success of Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman in 1943, Universal took their popular franchise in a new direction with more Monster Rally films. House of Frankenstein upped the ante and brought together several of the studio's iconic actors and monsters in a single narrative while delving into the ideas of scientific hubris and brain transplants, while also trying to use science to fix supernatural curses. Directed by Earl C. Kenton, known on this channel for his work on Island of Lost Souls from 1932 and Ghost of Frankenstein from 1942. This film is a sequel to Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. The story follows Dr. Gustav Niemann, played by Boris Karloff, a deranged scientist who escapes from prison with his hunchbacked assistant, Daniel. They encounter a traveling sideshow, conveniently featuring Count Dracula's skeleton, and Niemann gets the idea to revive Dracula to get revenge on his enemies. But alas, this is just a brief side plot. The pair then discover the frozen bodies of Frankenstein's monster and Larry Talbot, also known as the Wolfman, in the ruins of Frankenstein's castle. He revives both, promising to cure Talbot in exchange for Frankenstein's diary. But his true intentions are to transplant brains and create a new race of monsters. And as usual, nothing goes as planned. The film boasts a remarkable cast on paper, Boris Karloff, famous for playing Frankenstein's monster in earlier films, takes on the role of the villainous Dr. Neiman. Karloff even coached the new monster, Glenn Strange, while on set. Lon Chaney Jr. reprises his role as Talbot and the Wolfman, while John Carradine briefly appears as Count Dracula. J. Carol Nash plays the hunchback Daniel. Other notable cast members include Lionel Atwill, George Zuko, and Anne Gwynn. The screenplay was written by Edward T. Lowe, based on an adaptation of The Devil's Brood by Kurt Seedmack. The original idea for the script also included an appearance from the mummy himself, but was scrapped for budgetary reasons. Bella Lugosi was asked to reprise his role as Count Dracula, but there were scheduling conflicts with his touring production of Arsenic and Old Lace. The legendary Jack Pierce was responsible for the makeup effects, though this is not his best work. And distinct from most Universal films of the time that would just borrow music from previous productions, this one had an original score. Unlike most films for the time, we do have some financial information. The budget for the film was $354,000 and was completed within a 30-day shooting schedule. Boris Karloff was paid $20,000, Lon Chaney Jr. $10,000, and Glenn Strange, who even performed his own stunts, was paid $500 for his small role. House of Frankenstein received a limited release in December with a wider national release in February 1945, and proved popular with fans despite mixed critical reception. The New York Daily News praised its, quote, 
impressive, eerie, and horrendous settings, lighting, and costumes. While the New York Times noted that the film was more likely to, quote, garner as many chuckles as it does chills. Today, House of Frankenstein is remembered for featuring Boris Karloff in a different role than his iconic Frankenstein's monster, and its attempt to combine multiple legendary monsters in a single narrative. Though unfortunately, Dracula doesn't meet the monster or the wolfman as the poster advertises. The film's main influence can be seen in Universal's merchandising, with Glenn Strange's monster becoming the face used for posters, toys, and comic books in the 1950s and 1960s. While the film's plot may seem contrived by modern standards, it delves into the popular idea of reanimation and brain transplantation, placing it firmly in the realm of science fiction horror at the time. The film's popularity led to a follow-up, House of Dracula, in 1945, where the monsters finally interact. There's some decent cinematography here, but it does feel like two different films combined into one. It's obvious that the Dracula scenes were filmed separately from the rest of the production, and Carradine as Dracula isn't as charismatic as Lugosi. But then again, who else could possibly fill Lugosi's shoes? House of Frankenstein is available on DVD and Blu-ray with the Frankenstein collection as well as streaming on the Internet Archive. The Invisible Man's Revenge, directed by Ford Beebe, continued Universal's tradition of monster-centric and horror storytelling while exploring themes of revenge, power, and the ethical ramifications of scientific experimentation. Beebe was a veteran director with 200 film credits, but is known on this channel for his work on serials such as Flash Gordon's Trip to Mars and Buck Rogers. The film stars John Hall as Robert Griffin, a fugitive seeking vengeance against Sir Jasper and Lady Irene, who he believes cheated him out of his share of a diamond mine. Although Hall's character shares the Griffin surname with the previous Invisible Men, he is not related to those characters. And to add to the confusion, John Hall played the lead in 1942's Invisible Agent. Supported by a cast including Alan Curtis, Evelyn Ankers, Gail Sondergaard, Lester Matthews, and John Carradine as Peter Drury, a scientist experimenting with an invisibility formula. And Griffin becomes his latest test subject. Universal made a deal with H.G. Wells to make two more Invisible Man films, and the studio was hoping to get Claude Rains to return, but no such luck. The screenplay, which has little to do with Wells' original story, was penned by Bertram Milhauser, who was a prolific writer with over 60 films to his credit, including the Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes series. Notably, the film's visual effects were handled by John P. Fulton, who worked on many Universal monster films in the 1930s and 1940s, including The Mummy, The Invisible Man, and Bride of Frankenstein. Produced on a budget of just shy of $315,000, the film grossed $765,000 at the box office. Despite its financial success, the film received mixed reviews. While some praised the special effects and the film's entertainment value, others felt it was a formulaic entry into the series. The New York Herald Tribune said it was, quote, singularly unexciting but praised John P. Fulton's visual effects, but also noted that his tricks had been seen too many times before. While The Hollywood Reporter said it was, quote, one of the best and most entertaining of the series. Though The Invisible Man's Revenge marked the end of this phase of the series, it left a lasting influence. Universal would later spoof the concept in 1951's Abbott and Costello, Meet the Invisible Man. The film's exploration of invisibility, technology, the mad scientist trope, and the ethical dilemmas of scientific advancements firmly rooted in the science fiction genre. It continued the universal trend of blending horror 
and science fiction elements. While not as iconic as the original 1933 Invisible Man, this new installment is okay. It uses many of the same repetitive elements, such as objects floating and removing bandages. It's not serious, but at least it doesn't end as abruptly as most Universal monster films of the time. I wish John Carradine had more to do in this film, but my biggest issue is that the characters are just boring. The Invisible Man's Revenge is available on DVD and Blu-ray, on the Invisible Man Legacy Collection, and streaming for free on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Before we dive into the rest of the films of 1944, if you're enjoying the content, hit like and subscribe for more episodes on the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means a lot, and I appreciate everyone stopping by to share their love for this always evolving genre. When people think of Captain America today, they typically imagine Steve Rogers from the MCU, who was inspired by the comic books. However, the 1944 adaptation of Captain America, a 15-chapter production by Republic Pictures, has no connection to Steve Rogers, which many view as a missed opportunity. This adaptation took significant liberties with the source material, much to Timely Comics' disapproval, and stands as Republic Pictures' final superhero project. We follow District Attorney Grant Gardner, who moonlights as Captain America. He's attempting to stop the villainous Scarab, whose primary objective is to acquire two powerful devices. Unlike many Republic serials, the villain's identity is revealed to the audience from the beginning, adding an interesting dynamic to the narrative, especially since he's played by Lionel Atwill, who also co-starred in many Universal monster films over the years, including Son of Frankenstein and Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. Dick Purcell starred as Grant Gardner and Captain America, with Lorna Gray as his secretary, Gail Richards. Purcell sadly died a few weeks after filming was completed, possibly due to the physical strain of the role. The film was co-directed by Elmer Clifton and John English. Clifton, an American director and screenwriter with a background in silent films, had a prolific career in directing serials for various studios throughout the 30s and 40s. John English typically collaborated with William Whitney on many Republic serials like The Fighting Devil Dogs. Republic assembled their top seven writers for this project, but the result was a story filled mostly with fist fighting and shooting at each other. They repurposed a script about a vigilante, slapped on the Captain America title and costume, but retained little else from the original comic books. It appeared Republic had no interest in faithfully adapting the comic created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Timely Comics granted Republic the rights to adapt their popular character for free, hoping to attract new fans. However, they soon realized that Republic had made significant changes to the character during production. Timely was particularly displeased with Captain America using a gun and the absence of the World War II setting. Despite their concerns, Republic refused to make changes, citing the high cost of altering the production. With a budget of $182,000, Captain America was the most expensive serial produced by the studio. The serial diverged significantly from the comic book origins of Captain America. In the comics, Steve Rogers, a frail young man, becomes the super soldier Captain America through a secret serum, fighting against Nazi Germany during World War II. However, this serial's protagonist, Grant Gardner, lacks the super soldier backstory and military connection. The iconic shield was replaced with a standard gun, and there's no Bucky character. The sci-fi in the serial are the tech gadgets, rather than the genetically engineered superhero. It was re-released in 1953 under the title Return of Captain America. In recent years, it's been made available on VHS, DVD, and streaming online. 
allowing new generations to experience this early superhero adaptation, but they should be prepared for its lack of connection to the comic books. It's an average but repetitive serial if you like vigilante characters. There's more fist fighting than plot progression, and it would have been nice to see Steve Rogers in a war setting filmed while the war itself was still going on. Actually, I would have preferred to see Lionel Atwill's The Scarab Character as the lead. Captain America is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube. Time Flies is a uniquely British comedy sci-fi musical that explores the whimsical possibilities of time travel. Walter Ford, a prominent figure in British cinema with over 50 films to his credit, is known for his multifaceted career as an actor, director, and screenwriter. He directed the film that features an ensemble cast, led by Tommy Handley, a celebrated English comedian, best known for his work on the BBC radio show, It's That Man Again. Hanley plays Tommy Daventry, a hapless schemer. Evelyn Dahl, as Susie Barton, plays an American actress. And George Moon plays Bill. Felix Aylmer, renowned for his work with Laurence Olivier and for his role in 1964's Beckett, portrays the eccentric professor. Time Flies follows the misadventures of Tommy Daventry, who along with his friends accidentally travel back to the Elizabethan era using a time machine called the Time Ball. This spherical craft activates by flying into outer space. The group find themselves in 16th century London, where they encounter historical figures such as Queen Elizabeth I, William Shakespeare, Walter Riley, Captain John Smith, and Pocahontas. The group attempts to adapt to their surroundings, but the professor is arrested as a spy, Tommy is knighted by the Queen, and Susie helps William Shakespeare write Romeo and Juliet. Time Flies is sometimes called the first film to explore the concept of time travel, but the Hungarian film Sirius and the French film Sidereal Cruises predate it by two years, and I discussed both in my 1942 episode. It has a campy, fast-talking charm that makes it stand out from the mad scientist and monster sci-fi films of the 1940s. Sure, the time ball isn't scientifically accurate, but the idea fits well into the comedy setting. Time Flies is a nice change of pace. Despite some technical limitations and historical inaccuracies that we know of today, Time Flies remains a charming piece of 1940s British comedy, offering a glimpse into the early days of time travel narratives in film and showcasing the comedic talents of its era. There was not a lot of science fiction cinema coming out of the UK in the 1930s and 40s. Things to Come is probably the most well-known, but I've also looked at a few other gems like Once in a New Moon from 1934 and The Man Who Changed His Mind from 1936. This is a light-hearted addition to British sci-fi cinema. Time Flies is available for streaming on the Daily Motion website. Unfortunately, I was unable to find any DVD copies available for sale in the United States. It wouldn't be an episode of this series without Bella Lugosi, and this year we saw the last two films in Lugosi's nine-picture contract with Monogram Pictures. Return of the Ape Man is an example of Poverty Row Cinema, low-budget Hollywood studios making B-films quickly and with little money. Directed by Philip Rosen, a founding member of the American Society of Cinematographers, he had over 140 films to his credit and was known for his work on the Charlie Chan series in the 1940s. This is not a direct sequel to last year's The Ape Man, also starring Lugosi. He's now playing a different mad scientist. This time he's obsessed with transplanting a modern human brain into a caveman found frozen in ice during a scientific expedition. His goal is to civilize the ancient man by way of science. When his partner, played by John Carradine, has a sudden change of heart and no longer wants to conduct unethical experiments, the story takes a dark turn for Carradine. The ape man, now with a modern brain, 
uses his new intelligence, and becomes violent and uncontrollable. George Suko is originally cast as the Ape Man, but an illness early in the production limited his appearance to a brief few seconds, where the caveman is thawed from the ice. Suko would still receive third billing, despite his short screen time, thanks to his contract. Frank Moran, a former boxer known for his supporting roles as henchman, took over the role of the Ape Man for the remainder of the film. The screenplay was crafted by Robert Charles, whose only other credit is Voodoo Man, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. Interestingly, Charles is a pseudonym, but we don't know for whom. The working title for the film was Revenge of the Ape Man, and I think that suited it better. And like other films of the time, it utilized stock footage from previous productions, this time from the 1926 film Alaskan Adventures. The film had a lot going for it on paper, with Bella Lugosi and John Carradine, as well as exploring themes of scientific overreach and the ethical limits of experimentation. In the end, it's just another brain transplantation film, an idea that was quite popular at the time. While it is a low-budget production, I think it's a lot better than its predecessor, The Ape Man. Carradine provided a good moral counterpart to Lugosi's mad scientist that I wish was explored more. Return of the Ape Man is available on DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming for free on YouTube and the Internet Archive. Voodoo Man, also produced by Monogram Pictures, is a strange combination of mad scientist, sci-fi gadgets, horror, and the supernatural. It is more pseudoscience mixed with the supernatural rather than the sci-fi and horror hybrid that was popular at the time. William Bodine, a prolific director with over 170 films to his credit, shot this film in just seven days. His long career began working as an assistant to D.W. Griffith in The Silent Era and later directed numerous B-movies, including 1943's The Ape Man. The film features a cast led by Bella Lugosi as Dr. Richard Marlowe, a mad scientist who uses voodoo rituals and hypnosis to revive his comatose wife. Marlowe's henchmen kidnap young women and imprison them in a dungeon beneath the mansion, intending to transfer their life essences to his wife. As local law enforcement and a curious screenwriter, Ralph Dawson, close in on Marlowe's secret laboratory, the film builds to an obvious confrontation. John Carradine plays Toby, with George Zuko as Nicholas. Marlowe's loyal assistants. Wanda McKay and Louise Curry play two abductees, and Michael Ames as Ralph, playing a screenwriter who delivers the most meta line at the end of the film. When Ralph hands in his screenplay based on the adventure he just experienced, he suggests... Who do you see play the part of the voodoo man? Say, why don't you try to get that actor, uh, Bela Lugosi? It's right up his alley. <laughs> the screenplay was written by Robert Charles, based on the story Tiger Man, by Andre Colvin. Monogram Pictures purchased the story and adapted it for the screen, although Colvin did not receive screen credit. Even with its low budget, the producers spent most of the money on a few expensive cars that didn't even matter to the plot in any way, so unfortunately there was little to spend on sets and costumes. Voodoo Man remains an interesting artifact of the mid-20th century horror cinema. It's a combination of voodoo rituals and pseudo-scientific experiments that explores the intersection of advanced, albeit fictional, scientific practices with the mystical and the macabre. It is a crazy story with some high-tech gadgets in the lab, like a television monitoring system. Carradine and Zuko are unfortunately underused, and their roles could have been played by any nondescript actor. Voodoo Man is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive if you would like to check it out. Jungle Woman, released by Universal Pictures, was directed by Austrian filmmaker Reginald Leborg, known for his low-budget B-horror films. It's the second in a trilogy about a gorilla named Chila, who undergoes an experiment from a mad scientist in the first film, and she becomes the woman Paula Dupree. Evelyn anchors as Beth, 
Milburn Stone as Fred and Aquanetta as Paula all reprise their roles from the first film. This would be Aquanetta's last time playing Paula, as she was replaced by Vicki Lane in the final film, Jungle Captive, in 1945. New cast members include J. Carol Nash as Dr. Carl Fletcher, Richard Davis as Bob, the new object of Paula's obsession, and Louise Collier as Joan, the woman standing in Paula's way. Paula survived the events of the previous film and finds herself in a sanitarium run by the kindly Dr. Fletcher. Like the last film, she can transform between a human woman and a feral ape, but this time, she can speak. The sky is blue on bright days and dark before a storm. When she reverts to her ape status, a series of violent attacks and murders follow. The story unfolds through a series of flashbacks during a court proceeding, with Dr. Fletcher on trial for Paula's murder. This allows for the first third of the film to reuse scenes from the first film, which was a cost-saving measure that contributed to the film's disjointed narrative. Director Reginald LeBorg described the film as atrocious and the idea as silly, yet he was under contract and had no choice but to complete the project. The film was shot in either seven or ten days, depending on differing accounts. Additionally, the film faced issues with the production code due to perceived bestiality, resulting in a toned-down script. The critical reception was mixed. Variety praised Nash for his, quote, usual steady performance, but the New York Times blasted the film's scientific premise. The film attempted to capitalize on the success of 1942's Cat People, but it never quite reached the same level of popularity. Universal was attempting to create new monsters to add to its roster with 1943's Captive Wild Woman, but Paula was never as popular, and Universal gave up and just made more sequels to Frankenstein, Dracula, and The Invisible Man. And the trilogy ended in 1945 with The Jungle Captive. It is a bit annoying that they spent so much time reusing footage from the first film, but I do understand it was a cost-saving measure during wartime. The experiments in the first film put this sequel in the sci-fi genre. This one is about jealousy and animal instincts between some rather dull characters. J. Carol Nash, as usual, is the standout. He's way too good for these low-budget films. Jungle Woman is available on DVD and streaming for free on the Internet Archive. It is like seeing the dead return to life. I must know who she is. That can do no good. The dead have no place among the living. I shall be the judge of that. Producers Releasing Corporation was a Poverty Row studio known for making economical B films, despite limited resources, usually with budgets under $100,000, and filmed in less than 10 days. The Monster Maker was directed by Sam Newfield, one of the most prolific directors in Hollywood, with 250 films, mostly westerns, to his credit. Newfield was also the cinematographer on this project and was uniquely invested in the film's production, as his brother Sigmund was the head of the studio. We once again follow Oscar nominee J. Carol Nash, this time as Dr. Igor Markov, a role originally intended for Bella Lugosi. Joining him is Ralph Morgan, playing the unfortunate concert pianist, Anthony Lawrence. Tala Burrell, as Markov's assistant Maxine, was a Romanian actress best known as Marlena Dietrich's double in European films before Dietrich moved to Hollywood. Rounding out the cast are Wanda McKay as Patricia and Glenn Strange as the henchman Steve, who also appeared as the monster in House of Frankenstein this year. And Ace the Wonder Dog also makes an appearance, saving one of the characters. The Monster Maker revolves around Dr. Igor Markov's sinister experiments. Obsessed with Patricia Lawrence, Dr. Markov injects her father, Anthony, with a serum that induces acromegaly, a real disorder exaggerated for dramatic effect in the film. It's caused by the pituitary gland's excessive production of a growth hormone, resulting in the grotesque enlargement of bones. 
Markov's nefarious plan is to force Patricia into marrying him in exchange for an antidote to the disease. Despite its small budget, the Monster Maker features effective use of makeup and special effects to depict the horrifying transformation central to the plot. With makeup from Maurice Siderman, known for his work on Citizen Kane and A Touch of Evil. This takes the use of science to threaten the innocent to a new level. Dr. Markov's serum, which artificially induces acromegaly, represents fictional medical technology far beyond the capability of 1940s science. This is a strange film that doesn't start to get interesting until halfway through. I'm beginning to say this a lot, but J. Carol Nash is the standout of the film. And Ace the Wonder Dog is a very good boy, and I wish he had a bigger role. The Monster Maker is available on DVD and streaming on 2 TV, YouTube, and the Internet Archive. The Lady and the Monster was directed by George Sherman for Republic Pictures, based on Kurt Seedmack's novel, Donovan's Brain. This was the first of three films to explore Seedmack's chilling story as it delves into the dark consequences of scientific ambition through the tale of a preserved brain with telepathic powers. We follow Professor Franz Mueller, played by Eric von Stroheim, whose character does not appear in the original book. The studio introduced his mad scientist role to align the film with the popular sci-fi horror subgenre of the era. Mueller works with his assistants on a daring experiment to keep the brain of a deceased millionaire, W.H. Donovan, alive after a plane crash near their desert laboratory in Arizona. As the experiment progresses, the brain gains telepathic powers and begins to control Patrick Corey, played by Richard Arlen. The lady from the film's title is Janice Farrell, played by Vera Ralston, a former Czechoslovakian ice skater turned actress. She must save her love, Dr. Corey, as Donovan's brain moves forward with its sinister plans. The film has some pretty good black and white cinematography from John Alton, known for his work in film noir. This enhances the eerie ambiance. However, the production was not without its challenges. Director George Sherman reportedly found working with Vera Ralston so challenging that he left Republic Pictures after completing the project, despite his long tenure with the studio. The film underwent several title changes during production, including The Monster, The Monster's Castle, and The Brute, before finally settling on The Lady and the Monster. But I think they should have stayed with the novel's title, Donovan's Brain. Critical reception was mixed, with some praising its atmospheric cinematography and von Stroheim's performance, others criticizing the pacing and Ralston's wooden acting. This film is often compared to its better-known 1953 remake, Donovan's Brain, starring Lou Ayers. The New York Times remarked that the film had, quote, lost an intriguing title and a large portion of plausibility and pace from the original novel. Despite its mixed reviews, The Lady and the Monster was re-released in 1949 as The Tiger Man, and Seedmack's novel later inspired a radio adaptation from Orson Welles, as well as two more film adaptations, Donovan's Brain in 1953 and The Brain in 1962. The narration throughout the film sounds like it's out of a detective story rather than science fiction. But I like the film even though the story does wander a bit too much. It's not a great film, but it's fun to see mad scientists doing something with brains other than typical transplantations. The central concept of keeping a human brain alive outside the body to explore telepathic control was an interesting concept. The Lady and the Monster is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube, the Daily Motion website, and the Internet Archive. And just a quick side note, I've linked all the films discussed today in the description below if you would like to check them out. Unlike its cinema counterpart, science fiction literature was in the middle of a dynamic period, primarily driven by the widespread popularity of pulp magazines like Astounding Science Fiction, featuring serialized novels and short stories. Themes of space travel, advanced technology, and dystopian futures were prevalent, often reflecting the societal anxieties of World War II 
and setting the stage for the genre's post-war period. Raymond F. Jones' Renaissance, originally serialized in Astounding Science Fiction this year, is an epic parallel dimension story that explores the interaction between two worlds. Olaf Stapledon's Sirius delves into the life of a genetically enhanced dog gifted with human intelligence and examines the complex relationship between humans and animals. Clifford D. C. Max's City, serialized in astounding science fiction beginning in 1944, envisioned a distant future where intelligent dogs and robots reflect on humanity's achievements and failures. Rene Barzavel's Future Times 3 explored time travel where a scientist invented a device allowing journeys into the past and future. The story was adapted into a French film in 1982. Though never directly adapted into a film, The Big and the Little, a short story by Isaac Asimov, was published in Astounding Science Fiction and continued the epic narrative of what would become Asimov's Foundation series. The collection would be published in novel form beginning in 1951. Foundation has been adapted into a television series currently airing on Apple TV. The pivotal battles of World War II overshadowed most historical events this year, influencing global politics, shaping what would become a challenging post-war period. History is interconnected with culture, science, the arts, and film. To fully grasp the sci-fi films of the late 1940s and early 1950s, it's essential to understand the broader historical and cultural context. And so for the rest of this episode, I'll touch on some significant historical, cultural, scientific, and cinematic events from this year. On January 27th, the Siege of Leningrad was lifted after 880 days, resulting in over 2 million Russian deaths. The United States captured the Marshall Islands from Japan on February 3rd. On March 24th, The Daring Great Escape, which was later made into a feature film, saw 76 Allied prisoners break out of Stalag Luft III. From May 15th to July 8th, saw the deportation of Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz. In contrast, Allied forces liberated Rome on June 4th. The D-Day landings in Normandy on June 6th marked the start of Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe. This massive military assault involved the coordinated efforts of American, British, and Canadian forces, leading to the eventual liberation of Western Europe. The Bretton Woods Conference, held from July 1st to 22nd, established the International Monetary Fund that would lay the foundation for a post-war international monetary system. Anne Frank wrote her final diary entry on August 1st, unaware that three days later, on August 4th, all occupants of the secret annex would be arrested by Nazi officers following an anonymous tip. The Battle of Guam began on July 21st and concluded on August 10th. A failed assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler, known as Operation Valkyrie, occurred on July 20th. The Warsaw Uprising against Nazi occupation started on August 1st. Paris was liberated on August 25th. Operation Market Garden commenced on September 17th, aiming to secure key bridges in the Netherlands. The Warsaw Uprising ended on October 2nd with the surrender of Polish resistance fighters. Finally, the Battle of the Bulge, the last major German offensive on the Western Front, began on December 16th and ended on January 25th, 1945. The cultural landscape of this time was marked by significant events, some of which carry a lasting impact into today. In art, Francis Bacon's Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion is an unsettling depiction of human anguish, and it served a pivotal role in establishing Bacon as a leading figure in post-war modern art. Piet Mondrian's Victory Boogie Woogie, his final unfinished work before his death, embodies his innovative approach to abstract art. Felix Nussbaum's Triumph of Death is a haunting, surreal portrayal 
of the horrors of war and the Holocaust, conveying a profound sense of despair and the artist's premonition of his death in Auschwitz. Photographers embedded with the military played a crucial role in documenting pivotal events of the war. Robert Kappa's iconic Normandy landing photos from June 6th, known as the Magnificent Eleven, vividly portrayed the chaotic intensity of D-Day. Robert F. Sargent's Into the Jaws of Death is renowned for its striking depiction of American troops landing on Omaha Beach. Bing Crosby's Swinging on a Star was the most popular song in the United States this year. Would you like to swing on a star? Carry moonbeams home in a jar. Tennessee Williams' play The Glass Menagerie became a defining work of American drama. Agatha Christie's Murder on the Nile, A Suspenseful Mystery, and the musical On the Town took Broadway by storm. But in Nazi-occupied Paris... Jean Anouilly's adaptation of Antigone premiered on February 6th, symbolizing resistance through its dramatic reinterpretation of a classic tragedy. The advancements in science and technology marked a year of groundbreaking discoveries and innovations. In biology, the avery mcleod mccarty experiment published on February 1st, established DNA as the carrier of genetic information, a cornerstone of modern genetics. The Hanford site, part of the Manhattan Project, produced its first plutonium on November 6th. June 13th marked the first operational use of the German V-1 flying bomb, followed by the V-2 rocket's operational use on September 8th, which crossed into the edge of space. At this time, cinema was deeply influenced by the ongoing war, with many films serving as propaganda to boost morale and depict wartime experiences. Actor James Stewart led a bombing raid on Berlin on March 22nd, while many others served on the front lines or behind the scenes in the war effort, reflecting the close intertwining of Hollywood and global events. Creatively, film noir, a genre that was gaining prominence with its dark, Complex narrative and mood mirrored the anxieties of the era. Going My Way was the biggest hit of the year in the United States, and its star, Bing Crosby, was the top money-making actor of the year. Future legends made their big screen debuts this year, with Angela Lansbury in Gaslight and Gregory Peck in Days of Glory. The 17th Academy Awards were held on March 15, 1945, and were hosted by Bob Hope. Going My Way led the pack with 10 nominations and took home seven awards, including Best Picture, Best Director for Leo McCary, and Bing Crosby for Best Actor. The musical comedy follows Father Chuck O'Malley, played by Crosby, a young priest who is assigned to revitalize a struggling parish while forming a bond with its eccentric parishioners. Ingrid Bergman won her first Oscar as the leading lady in Gaslight. Directed by George Cukor, this psychological thriller centers on a woman whose husband manipulates her into believing she's going insane. Cinema outside of Hollywood still pushed forward. In the United Kingdom, Laurence Olivier's adaptation of Shakespeare's Henry V was lauded for its morale-boosting effect during the war. The Soviet Union's Ivan the Terrible, Part 1, directed by legend Sergei Eisenstein, offered a grand portrayal of the Russian Tsar. And the French film Les Enfants du Paradis, directed by Marcel Carnet, emerged as a classic, celebrated for its rich storytelling and production design. Hollywood was still the dominant producer of films in the 1940s. This year saw some groundbreaking future classics, including 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, starring Spencer Tracy as Lieutenant Colonel James H. Doolittle. This film recounts the daring Doolittle raid on Tokyo during World War II. Meet Me in St. Louis, directed by Vincent Minnelli and starring Judy Garland. This musical follows a family as they experience life and love in a year leading up to the 1904 World's Fair. Double Indemnity, directed by Billy Wilder, 
starring Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck, is a classic film noir that tells the story of an insurance salesman who gets roped into a murder plot by a seductive housewife. Directed by Otto Preminger, Laura stars Jean Tierney and Dana Andrews in a mystery film revolving around a detective who falls in love with the portrait of a supposedly murdered woman. Lifeboat, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, is a suspense film that follows a group of survivors from a torpedoed ship who are adrift in a lifeboat and must decide what to do with a rescued German officer. And finally, On the Town, starring Gene Kelly and Frank Sinatra. This musical follows three sailors on a 24-hour leave in New York City as they seek fun and adventure. In 1944, science fiction cinema displayed a fascinating blend of monstrous transformations, mad scientist, and creative, though not always successful, storytelling, reflecting both the era's fascination with the supernatural and its creative limitations. There was some singing, a few sequels, and more Bella Lugosi. It's not the most memorable year, but a fascinating one all the same. Overall, the science fiction films of this year not only entertained audiences, but also laid the groundwork for future innovations in the genre, blending horror, science fiction, and comedy in ways that would continue to influence filmmakers for decades to come. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content. And I will see all of you in 1945.